Um, so I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Niles Main District Library Board of Trustees. Diane Bo when, uh, Winberg, if you would note the time, please. Uh, 701. And do a roll call. Okay, Karen? Here. Carolyn? Here. Uh, Becky? Here. Diane? Here. Patty is running late. And Linda's running late, and Umar is running late. Okay. All right. Well, oh. we will proceed with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I see oh, Umar I is uh, joining us right now. Oh, okay. So we will just launch right into the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. So, if you'd like to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. 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 And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, the next thing on our, I just want to welcome informally uh, Becky Keene Adams and Omer Kadir, our new about to be sworn in members. We're going to get to that shortly. Uh, but the next thing on our agenda is the approval of the minutes. Um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of September 16th, 2020? Motion. Okay. And I'll just make the second. Okay. Uh, any comments or questions about the, motion, the minutes of September 16th, 2020? No, I don't have any. Okay. Anything else from anyone? No. Okay. All right. Uh, then all in favor of approving those minutes of September 16th, 2020. Um, well, let's do a roll call. Diane, would you do a roll call? Uh, Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Yes. Uh, Diane? Yes. All right. So uh, it's now our pleasure to swear in to new uh, trustees to the Niles Main District Library Board of Trustees. Um, I don't think we've done this before by Zoom, so um, you can sit or stand however you feel comfortable. And I'm gonna turn this proceeding over now to Diane Olson, who's our secretary. And as such, uh, Diane, I believe you will be reading the, um, the words of the, uh, that they will be stating, is that correct? Yes, I'm ready. I think I'll do it separately, if you don't mind. That's up to you. Oh, okay. All right, so Rebecca, would you like to be first? Sure. Okay, please repeat after me. I, Rebecca Keen Adams, do solemnly swear. I, Rebecca Keen Adams, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Trustee. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of Trustee. Of the Niles Main Library District to the best of my ability of the Niles Main Library District to the best of my ability. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, Umer. I, Umer uh, Abdul Qadir, do solemnly swear. I, Umer Abdul Qadir, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Trustee. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Trustee. Of the Niles Main Library District to the best of my ability of the Niles Main Library District to the best of my ability. No, thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. You. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you both very much. Uh, I wish we had something a little <coughs> bit more formal we could do than what we're doing right now, but I think it's the best we can do under the circumstances. 
We do all want to welcome you to our board. We look forward to working with you. And um, I, I'm just going to ask if you both would like to, uh, if you each would like to say something about yourself, maybe just one or two sentences, nothing long, uh, just to give our viewers, um, I, don't, I don't know that we have a lot, but whoever might be viewing this tape, a, a chance to know something about you. Um, Umer, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, my name is Umer Kadir. I'm a resident of unincorporated Maine, Maine Township, uh, which is also within the library district. Uh, I am a former trustee for three years at the Des Plaines Public Library. Uh, I'm a father of three and uh, run a small business as a patent attorney. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Becky? Yes, so I am Becky Keen Adams. I have lived in Niles for about five years. I am currently working at the Des Plaines Library, and I'm also in graduate school for my degree in library and information sciences. I have three kids that are all in schools uh, very close by, and also they all use the library a ton when it's open, um, and I'm very happy to be here. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, welcome to you both. So moving right along, um, do we have any requests for public comment? No, um, I, I have heard now from Linda Ryan and she said both she and Patty are having a hard time getting into the meeting. I So hopefully we aren't missing any uh, patrons who would like to be in, but I have not received anything and there is nobody here. So Patty and Linda, do they, they both have the link? Ah, uh, there we go. Patty okay. must have found hers. Patty, all right. I presume Linda will join us soon. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Patty. Okay. Uh, we are just at that point in the agenda where we move on for our uh, trustee reports. Uh, first is the report of the president. Um, mostly what our board has been concerned with this past month is um, filling vacancies on the board. That's been something that's been of a great concern to us, and I'm glad we've moved forward with that. Uh, we unfortunately lost our president, Tim Spadoni, when he moved away. Uh, Tim was a great um, um, help to our board and really served wonderfully as our president for a while. Uh, and then um, we, of course, uh, last week were interviewing uh, replacements for his position when um, another one of our trustees, Sue Wilsey, uh, decided that she was going to resign from her position as a trustee because of increasing professional commitments that made it difficult for her to put as much time into serving as a board member as she would like to do. And I think upon seeing all the very fine candidates who were willing to step up and help us uh, run the library here, I think Sue felt that it was the time uh, for her to step aside, uh, devote most of her time to her, the demands on her professional life and to allow some other people to serve on the Niles Main District Library Board. So uh, that, that worked out pretty well and we were glad that we were able to do that. So um, that's it really for my report. Uh, do any of the other trustees have any um, particular report to make? Uh, Patty, I'll get to you uh, for your treasurer's report shortly. Okay, just in terms of other people, anyone else have a report to make? No. No, okay. I do not. All right. Penny, are you ready with your treasurer's report um, at this time? I wasn't really sure if you were or not. You're Penny, muted, you are Patty. muted. Mute. Patty, unmute yourself. Yes, I'm right. sorry. <laughs> okay. I didn't see myself muted, and then all of a sudden I had a mute sign. <laughs> okay, all right, fine. Uh, were you prepared to present a treasurer's report this evening? Absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. October is when we give the uh, report for the fourth month of the fiscal year. We are 33% of the way through the year. Revenues... Uh, property taxes are 30% of the budget, investment income at 62%, total revenues are at 30% of the budget. Expenditures, total salaries at 26% of the budget, 
Total library materials at 25% of the budget. Total li library operation expenditures at 18% of the budget. Um, general and administration is at 22% of the budget. Total employee fringe benefits at 26% of the budget. Hang on a second, I gotta flip the page. Uh, total utilities at 28% of the budget. Total um, audit expenditures, 78%. Mm -hmm. Total liability expenditures, 100%, which is normal for this time of year. Total building and equipment is at 12%. And total expenditures is 20%. Thank you very much. All right, Patty, thank you. Anyone have any questions on the um, treasurer's report? Okay. Um, I have Carol, some questions uh, on the reports, on the consolidated statement and the checks. Is that now? Carolyn, did payment you have a question? Of bills. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, so never, I'm, I'm incorrect. It's payment of bills I have questions for. Thank you. Okay, fine, we'll move on to that. And to get that up on the floor, I'm going to ask uh, for a motion to approve the payment of bills, specifically mm -hmm. the operating expenses of $204,443.35, payroll expenses of $274,884.45 for a total monthly expense of $479,291.80. Do I have such a motion? Motion. Patty? Yes, ma'am. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. All right, that is on the floor now. Do we have any uh, discussion about the payment of the bills? I have a couple of questions. Um, yes, can you hear me? Uh, yep. Yes, as long as you're, yes, yes. Okay, I'm looking at, um, I think it's page one of the income statement, consolidated income statement under, I believe it's payroll. It looks like, if I'm reading this correctly, we have a payroll associate one, and it's for, oh gosh, these numbers, I think it's 9,000, and then two lines down, we have another payroll associate one, and it's, nine, it's oh, it's 2,000. Are those the same positions? Um, oh, no, are, you, are you looking at the income statement consolidated for September 30th, is that right? Yes. And is that correct, the first, Karen? Yes, the first okay. page. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know if you, Patty, or you, Greg, um, uh, understood that question. I'm not sure uh, exactly where you're um, pointing to right now, first? Carolyn, but perhaps Greg or Patty uh, can see that. Yeah, so if, um, if you allow me, um, the first number that you looked at, Carolyn, uh, payroll associate one for $9,887 is uh, separate, distinct, and apart from the lines, from the line two down, uh, which is actually oh. payroll associate three uh, yes, for 2280 Yeah, no problem. Okay, okay so those are two different are those, positions. Is that right, Greg? Yes. That's, I, that's correct. Okay. And are those one person positions or are there a few in there? I mean, I'm trying to figure out what does that represent for 2000? It must be one person, right? No, um, it's, uh, it's at least two people I know. Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd have to go back and check. Okay. Well, my mistake there, it's a one and a three and I saw that now. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. And, and then I just had one other question, and it's in the um, check breakdown. The well, actually, it's the bank register report, the last page of the check breakdown. It is, I believe, a check, a payment written to. It's a manual check to Catherine Levinson uh -huh. for. Um, I think it. $1,659.47. Is that a vendor? No. Uh, uh, Kate is actually a, um, an employee of ours. 
uh, and uh, I believe she's in attendance actually. So uh, uh, what happened is uh, Kate made a change to her banking information in the payroll system and um, the change was not correct. Uh, so her uh, payroll check actually bounced and was, uh, was returned to us, it was credited back to us. So uh, in order to uh, uh, keep, you know, keep the timeliness of the payroll, uh, we issued a manual check in the net amount of, uh, that you see there, 1,659.47. Sure. Okay, understandable. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Uh, all right, thank you, Carolyn. Do we have any other it. questions or comments? Yeah, this is Umer. I've got a, a couple of quick yeah. questions. Yes. Uh, so number one, uh, I saw again on the income statement uh, that the per capita grant was expected at 71605 and then the amount received was zero. Is that simply because the state has not dispersed the per capita grant funds yet? or And you were expecting them to get them this month, but they hadn't dispersed them? Yeah, we actually got them in, um, in the last week or so. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, just a little bit late, but, you know, the state is, uh, I think, struggling at this point. No, I, I completely understood. I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, the second question I had, and this is more, um, it's, it's not really a budget question, but it, it comes out of the budget. So one of the things I noticed was that the monthly budget for things that tended to be written was exceeded and the monthly budget for things that tended to be online was not met. So, you know, overall, the spending was roughly <laughs> the same, and that's completely understandable. You know, funds yeah. sometimes don't get spent the way you expect them to. Um, but I'm surprised that in the midst of the pandemic that, you know, we're, 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 uh, we have more expenditures on physical, physical in-print materials or actual physical materials than we do online. And just wanted to know how that came about and why that came about. Um, I do have an answer for that. One thing is that the in the book budget for the adults, they have a book rental program that was prepaid. So that's partly why it's higher. Um, and then also some of the uh, e-books and e-audio books were purchased using per capita funds. Got so it. we actually Got have it. until... Um, December 31st to finish spending last year's per capita money. So that was part of what that money was. So, so the eBooks were actually classified simply as books. And so that's why they're not showing, that's why they're no, showing as if they're- They're under, uh, they're usually under the downloadables. That would be the book budget. But right. she, um, she has that very allocated. And so if she knew she was going to go over, she would request per capita funds to, uh, and I encouraged her to do that because as you say, we are getting more circulation from those things. Right. So she is spending her money and then uh, getting any additional money she needs from per capita. Got it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Good any time. other uh, questions or comments uh, regarding the payments? All I right, really like that the um, the bank register report is here because I did have questions on the checks that were made out to individual people. And so I was able to look at that. So that was very helpful. Great. Okay. But you didn't have any other questions right now. Is that, no. is that correct, Becky? That's okay. correct. All right. Okay. Uh, unless there are any additional questions, we do have a motion on the floor to approve those, uh, the payment of those expenses. Uh, Diane, would you do a roll call? Uh, Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Uh, no. Becky? Yes. Diane? Diane, Diane you're on mute. Oh, on mute. Not anymore. Okay, sorry. Uh, yes. Go. Okay. Uh, Umar? Uh, yes. Okay. Patty? Yes. And Linda? Yes. Okay, that passes. Thank you very much. Where's Linda? I don't see her. Um, Okay. Did you, oh, wait, Linda, do we hear yes. you? Yes. You said you are. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is the director's report. Um, Susan, we do have from you an extensive written report uh, in our packet. Um, and there's a lot going on here uh, at the library, I can tell that. 
But I don't know if you wanted to hit on some of the highlights of the report or perhaps add anything that didn't get into your written report. I do have a couple of things. Um, I will, I'm gonna do a little presentation on the statistics. You had asked about that last month. And so um, I have statistics in the report and then I have some more information about it. But before I do that, I'm gonna ask Greg to fill you in a little bit on the roofing project because he's made some progress with that this last month. Cool, cool. Okay. Okay, um, we had um, a team from building um, BEC, Building Envelope Consultants, come out and uh, go up onto the roof. Uh, they did uh, extensive testing. Uh, they, they did uh, a complete nuclear test of the uh, roof, looking at the substrates and, and the uh, uh, insulation condition and so forth. They did either 10 or 12 uh, core samples where they uh, actually uh, cut into the roof and uh, took all the material under their cut out and uh, took a look at it. And um, the preliminary indication is that they have, in fact, um, found two large areas uh, or two significant areas where uh, the insulation needs to be completely removed all the way down to the decking uh, and, uh, and replaced uh, up to a uh, village specifications. Uh, and then of course recovered uh, with a membrane. Uh, and uh, I believe their report is going to say uh, that they recommend replacing uh, the entire membrane uh, after they build up the insulation layer to uh, be with uh, to be compliant with the current code, um, no, no estimates other than that. I don't have an official report from them yet. I'm I'm waiting for that, uh, and when they do deliver it, we should have them uh, in front of the board to uh, answer questions uh, of a technical nature. Mm. Um, the second thing that um, the second thing that we've done is that we uh, put an ad um, on the front of our website asking for solar engineering companies and architects to, uh, uh, to uh, send us information about their capabilities and so forth so that we can uh, get them uh, to uh, give us a bid on uh, providing uh, information about whether or not a solar panels are good for us if they if they decide that the math does work uh, and can access appropriate uh, grant funds and and so forth, uh, uh, basically calculating a payback period or a, a return on investment, um, and it's favorable as the board sees it, then they would go into uh, a design phase. Um, that design phase would lead to bids, and then just like with uh, BEC. Um, you know, they would look at the bids, help us select the right uh, bidder that's right for the job at the best value, and then uh, move forward uh, to make sure that the uh, project is uh, installed or implemented uh, as they designed it. Uh, so we're just starting with that. Um, I have some firms that I've uh, received on recommendation that I'm reaching out to, um, but don't have anything uh, definite yet. Uh, from uh, from anybody, if you look at the uh, uh, if you look at the uh, advertisement online on our website, um, it closes the uh, it closes delivery or closes the submission period on uh, November sixth at five uh, five p.m. That's a Friday, uh, and will give us information so that we can uh, present it to the board uh, or the board can. Uh, you know, arrange a special meeting to do uh, interviews and uh, and get them uh, get them engaged. Okay, um, Patty, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, off and on. Yes, my main question is: Do you think the paperwork you're wait, waiting for from BDC should be for here by our next meeting? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so then we can look at it and review it then. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, my plan is to have them actually present it and make cool. sure that, you know, make sure that they uh, address any questions from the board. Mary, I see your hand is up. Yeah, so uh, 
Greg, what I wanted to know is you had mentioned that the insulation does not meet the code requirement. Is that a, is that a hazard such, it, such that it's, you know, potentially hazardous to, you know, like say, for example, asbestos in the, in the insulation or some other feature that would cause particular, you know, um, uh, you know, harm of some sort potentially or is it more like you know the type of thing where well code says you have to have three h and three eighth inch pipe and you know we have one quarter inch and something so yeah it could cause a problem but it's nothing immediate it, which it's, type of flaw it, is it, I guess? it's our value so uh, basically the thickness of the uh, of the insulation uh current uh, the current code requires r30 um okay. and um uh, we have uh, various levels depending on which roof we're standing on uh, okay. from, uh, I think it, it, on average, it's about R24 or something like that, um, which means that they would have to add a, a layer of uh, rigid insulation to bring it up to R30. Okay. So, so does that mean, does that mean essentially the bottom line there is right now it's not insulating well enough? If we're looking at simply yeah, it's, well, it, um, let me say it just a little bit differently. It's it's not insulating um, in accordance with the code. You know, I mean, either way. Okay, yeah, yeah. got it. Um, uh, it's uh, probably Carolyn, wouldn't Carolyn. probably have gone in and fixed it on its own, but there are other issues with the roof and the age of the roof. So now that we're touching it, we're going to have to bring it up to the code. Right. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carolyn, did you have your hand up? I did. I have I had a question. So Greg, um, are you stating that you're requesting bids and you um, placed an ad on the website? Is that what this ad's about? Uh, for for uh, solar uh, engineers and architects slash architects. Okay. Now I was of the belief that we are obligated to advertise our bids, our requests for bids in the newspaper. No. No, I believe it's in the statutes. We no longer have to do that. Um, what um, what the statute actually says is that uh, putting it on our website satisfies the uh, advertisement requirement. So Greg, I, what, what we're asking we're, for here yeah. is not bids to do the work, but rather be, uh, proposals from individuals who will evaluate who will serve as evaluators of the bids or of the bid uh, language. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, it, you know, a little bit beyond that. Um, uh, you know, start off with helping us do a, um, an evaluation of whether or not solar is the right answer for the library. So in other words, you know, we had some preliminary uh, information about a year ago um, where uh, a firm came out on a, um, on a casual basis did a walk around, we talked in broad terms, and they said right now, uh, a year ago, um, solar panels cost about $4 a watt, completely installed, hooked into the system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we use uh, approximately 90,000 kilowatt hours per year. So it would mean roughly that a cost of an in installation would be about $400,000. Uh, we pay in total um, about $85,000 a year in electricity. So the payback, you know, would be pretty, uh, pretty quick between four and five years. Um, uh, the, um, uh, then the, then the, then the second, you know, the follow, follow on question is where to get the money from other than our own checkbook. And there are grants available. Um, there are some grants at the state level at the, at the federal level. They would do that research to find uh, grants uh, for us to, you know, that we could apply for and, and try to, uh, you know, basically defray the cost. There's also a grant, or at least there was a year ago, with um, uh, a big library database supplier called EBSCO. Uh, EBSCO has uh, it had at the time a grant of $100,000 for qualifying programs. Um, last year, it didn't make sense for us to pursue it because we were uh, not decisive on whether or not to replace the roof. But as we get closer and as we get to a point where 
you know, it looks like we are going to replace the roof, then uh, the solar project, you know, should be added to it. And solar panels will generally uh, last uh, about 25 years. Um, which means that what we should try to do is match the uh, roof warranty to that. So, you know, if, for example, we had a 15 year warranty on the roof and then we had to replace it, let's say in the 16th or 17th year, it wouldn't make sense to pick up all the panels and put them back down because they had another eight years to go. Um, so if we can try to match those so that they expire at the same time, we'd be in, in a much better position. Uh, of course. Uh, the beauty of it all is, is if we're able to save the full amount, let's say $85,000 a year over 25 years, um, that should pay for the uh, installation of the solar uh, array. And it should also pay for, uh, more than pay for the uh, uh, replacement of the roof membrane and bringing the uh, uh, the roof insulation up to code um, and so forth. So, you know, looking at it over uh, a long period of time without taking interest rates into consideration, which are pretty close to zero at this point, um, you know, um, you, it looks like it would it would be pretty close to uh, break even in terms of expenditures and benefits coming in. But, okay. You know, but that's, you know, that's an accounting guy, you know, talking about limited numbers that we received on a preliminary basis. And I think it's important that we get some uh, real science behind it, if, you know, if you don't mind me use, using that term, um, and some real rigor uh, in the numbers so that, you know, the board can actually see what, you know, you know, what the paybacks would be and so forth. Okay, thank you. Well, Mayor, did I see your hand up again or did you get your question answered? Clarification, oh, just one second. I thought Omer had his hand up first. If, if you're. I'm trying to confirm what he, when Carolyn, he answered my Carolyn, question. Just, just one second. Omer had his. Uh, did you have a question, I'm Omer, not or not? Finished. I'm not finished. I, I know, but he had his hand up first, is what I'm saying. Although I'm not sure if okay, you were frozen well, you right now. You interjected and I lost my place, but go right ahead. When you guys are ready, can I please talk to Greg? Thank yes. you. Yes, yes. No problem. Okay, Umair, I'm sorry. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just had one quick question. So do you expect um, the full 80, uh, the number of sol solar panels will cover the full energy needs of the library? Um, we have to see. You know, I mean, right now, um, they when they looked at the roof a year ago, they said that as the roof stands now, uh, it can support an array that would generate 80,000 uh, kilowatt hours of electricity. Right now, our annual use is right around 90,000. And uh, so um, what was a question was whether or not other areas of the roof could support uh, additional uh, panels. So we may get up, you know, they may be able to get up to it. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the, what any modifications uh, if needed would, you know, would cost um, in order to, in order to strengthen the roof to support the array, uh, you know, for the remaining 10,000. And I just want to caution you by, by saying that they took, um, they took a casual look at the drawings and a casual look, you know, so, I mean, you're smiling, but, you know, with reason, you know, when they tear the cover off and they actually crawl around in the roof and they actually look at, you know, um, you know, the structure compared to the as-builts, um, then they'll figure out whether or not the actual structure is representative of the, of the drawings and therefore can, you know, draw a better conclusion about it. Right. Okay, Carolyn, you had a question. Well, yes, I, back to the first question. Um, so Greg, you're saying we are no longer required to um, place a bid in a newspaper um, of a certain size in order to be compliant. You said that's been eliminated by just putting it on the website? Yes, uh, I wouldn't say it, it's been eliminated, but that's what the law is. Okay, where's, is this the statute that you're referring to? Because I actually pulled this up in the middle of the um, roofing um, meeting and I didn't find it, but could you tell me where, where it is so then um, I can get that? 
Yeah, sure. I'll send it to you after the meeting, if you don't mind. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Linda. Thank you. All right, so let me continue with no, my director's Susan, report. Thank Susan, you. Uh, I, I think Linda had one question too. Oh, I'm I don't, sorry. If you wouldn't mind waiting one I more step. minute. Yes, nope, Linda, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, just really quick, uh, Susan, you had said that after we are touching part of the roof, then we have to bring it up to code. So um, I know we have multiple roofs. Mm -hmm. So if we're only touching two of the roofs, does that mean we still have to bring all of the roofs up to code? Or are we just assuming we're doing all of the roofs? Not assuming anything at this point. It's just okay. that, you know, it, we would not have to go in there and be messing with the insulation if we weren't doing a, a roofing project is all I'm saying. I, I don't know the extent of what the roofing contractors are going to or consultants are going to recommend at this point. Yeah, so. I, I was just wondering, you know, like if we don't have to possibly do one of the roofs, do we still have to bring that one up to code? You know, that, yeah, I well, mean, that's a good question. And I do oh, not know the answer okay. to that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure we will find out. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Thank you. For that. All right. Um, Susan, I'm afraid uh, your director's report took a long detour into a discussion <laughs> yeah. of well, roofs. That I, uh, I, I, uh, we'd like to circle back to that and yes. uh, wind that up again. Uh, anything you'd like to highlight or add? We'd like to know about that. Yes. I, uh, I want to talk about statistics. Um, I want to, I thought this, while you're getting ready to discuss the levy is a really good time to look at the past activity at the library for the, and particularly Carolyn had asked for information about how the statistics are looking um, since the pandemic, including the pandemic and since the pandemic. So on page two of my director's report, there's a little chart there of the statistics, which is you know, kind of microscopic, I'm afraid, because there's no way to make the director's report go landscape in our software for doing it online. So it's very small, and I apologize for that. If you look at it online, I think you can blow it up a little better. But in the meantime, I do have a presentation to kind of try to explain it a little more. So I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Oh, man. Okay, so um, this is a 14 month look back. And so I wanted to review uh, what has been going on uh, in the past few months since the pandemic started, because I'm this is particularly from the point of view of the pandemic. So we closed to the patrons on March 15th. We had one day of our curbside service where we pulled holds out to the vestibule and patrons came to pick them up and they got checked out right there on the spot. Um, by March uh, 17th, we had all staff working from home after the governor ordered the restaurants closed and then followed that up with the stay at home order. So that that by that week on the Wednesday, we had already, IT had already purchased additional Zoom licenses and staff began, began working seriously from home. So they started having meetings and presenting programs. So my central point with that is the building was closed, but the staff was working. And the fact that IT jumped in there, got us the Zoom licenses so quickly, I think is a real testament to how smoothly it, we went offline. I'm really kind of still awed by how fast the staff shifted over to virtual programming and virtual services. Um, so then we had several months at home. Then at June 1st, the stay at home order lifted. It's the staff returned to the building. We became working on that team structure, as you know, where we have people working four days in the building and then don't come back into the physical building for 10 days. And that's supposed to be the best way to manage uh, the epidemic is to not have staff giving it to each other. Uh, we began offering computer appointments, very limited for district residents on June 15th. We were, I think, the first library in the area to do that. And that was because our residents have a greater need for computers than um, residents in other areas. Uh, we picked up with June, uh, June 15th, we also started no hold contact holds pickup and we started opening our book ret return so that people could return the things they'd had for several months. And then in July, we opened up for express checkout. So all of these charts that you're going to see are based on those dates. So try to keep them in mind as you look at them. 
So here is our library visits. March. <laughs> What's up? I was just chuckling about March. It's all of a sudden there's a. Oh, yeah. Point. It's like, I always think of this as like we fell off the cliff. <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, we were doing very well and July is always one of our biggest months of the year. So it was all the more striking um, because it's summer reading then and March is our other big month of the year. And so, but the pandemic had already started. So our visits just come to an abrupt halt. You can see that now each month it's gone up a little bit. Uh, in August, we had almost 8,000 visitors again. That does not compare with the 33,000 that we had back in July 2019, but it is some recovery. Our checkouts, on the other hand, are doing really nicely. Checkouts of print materials um, already back up. You can see that I keep pointing at my screen as if you can see my finger, um, that we when we started letting them back in to pick up their holds, the circulation shot up immediately, all the way up to 25,000, and now in August, all the way up to 37,000. So I think that that shows um, that even though people started using the electronic things more, they do still really love their print materials. And so they were very excited to get their hands back on those again. Can I, can I, can I jump in with a very quick question? Sure. Um, does that show sort of a browsing effect? So for example, the difference between the, I can't read that number, I think it's 50K. Yeah, 50K in February to now 37-ish, does that sort of give you, I mean, this is kind of an interesting because you're never, never gonna have an opportunity to do this, do this again. Right, right. Um, Hopefully never gonna have God an opportunity. God forbid, yeah. Um, but so it kind of suggests that if I just tell people what's there and let them look it up themselves and come take it, I get, 37K a month checkouts. But if I let them come and look around and kind of browse the aisles, then there's a 25% increase based on people having the opportunity to simply browse. So it gives you an, it gives you a sense of what's the effect of browsing. Yeah. Yeah, I think the browsing definitely gave us a big boost, but you'll see a screen in a minute that shows how well our holds did too. So people still were finding things to, to place on hold, but, and that took a lot of staff time to go pull those. So it's so much more efficient for people to come in themselves and look for things. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. Even with the limited hours and everything, they're definitely finding what they were looking for. So we're happy about that. And yeah, you're right. This is a, this is a chance to really see that in action. So here's how our AV checkouts look. That's, those are our DVDs, our music CDs, uh, video games and the audiobooks. So all together here, you can see that they again fell off the cliff big time. Um, and they also have recovered. The DVDs were one of the very first things to recover. People really came and they must have, you know, with books, maybe there are more options, but with the DVDs, they were very happy to get their hands back on those. And then, our, but you, you can see that kind of the opposite happened where everything else fell off the cliff in ebooks and e audio books, things started going up. They uh, started to shoot up in a little bit up in February and then quite a bit more up in March and in April, continuing to go up. And so a lot of people discovered our overdrive collection, basically, is what this is. That's almost entirely what is, makes this number up. And so um, it's sliding back down just a little bit, but they basically, they learned a new thing and they are continuing to use it. So we're happy about that. And then the other form of um, reading online and streaming things online is actually in the database line of our statistics. So this includes Hoopla. The, I have listed at the top the um, databases that started to shoot up a little bit more that got the most use that increased. Um, and so tumble books is picture books for children that are read out loud. So we don't own them in the same way as we do with overdrive, but so because it's more of a, a thing where they go and look at it online, they don't download it to someplace. So that's what most of these things are, things that they're looking at online. Um, people started using the financial resources much more online than they had been. They're not coming in and looking at value line anymore. They're looking at it online. So all of these things got a big boost. Um, press readers started to get a big boost too, because that's where the newspaper subscriptions are now. We do have people just today, somebody went 
to youth services for some reason and told them how much they miss having a print copy of the newspaper and how much they wish that we would pick that back up again. But for now, at least we do have this that we can offer. And it has uh, uh, newspapers from around the world as well. So Susan, can I just yes. ask a quick question back sure. on that screen? Yep. So as a user of the library, I don't really see a lot of difference between Overdrive and Hoopla, but I guess, and but it's because you have them categorized differently because we own the Overdrive books. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've licensed them is really what it is. With eBooks, you don't ever get to own them, but, but, um, but yeah, it's a different, a different format where with Hoopla, it's simultaneous use. And as many people, whatever they have, as many people as want to can come in and look at it, but uh, it's charged in a different way. Where Overdrive, we're paying per book and for Hoopla, we're paying per use. Okay. Yep. Okay, thanks. Sure. Can I, I, I hate to sidetrack this again. Can I ask a quick sidetrack question about sure. lynda.com? Yep. Um, where did we fall on the whole uh, Lynda password? Um, um, we decided to go ahead and hold on to it for the time being, and then they kind of backed down. So right. we were very happy about that. Okay. Yeah, we, we were, you know, that, that was going to be a moral dilemma for us, and I'm glad that we did not have to make a decision. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I, for another time, I have some, I have some contacts which may, which ah, may help. That would be interesting. Good. Um, so Different we also, uh, people continued to put things on hold um, through the pandemic, uh, but you can see that obviously in April and May, we had no staff in the building to be pulling the holds. And of course, um, the delivery service between the libraries also came to a complete halt. So no holds were filled in April and May, but then as soon as we got back in the building, the holds really picked up. So you can see that back July, 2019, we had 6,400 holds. And in August, 2020, we were up at uh, like 6,700 holds. So they really came in and got their holds. And so we were uh, doing, uh, uh, that's where a lot of our effort went for the first few months of being open was just pulling those holds lists and running around and finding them. And now that we're able to get things from other libraries, we're able to satisfy more of them. So that's been a good thing. So that usage has bounced all the way back. Uh, so now moving on to technology, which is a big part of the service that we offer. This is strictly our PC use, no other form of technology. And here again, you can see it, it dropped down very, very badly. When we were closed, obviously right. there was none. Then we started letting people in for limited appointments in June, and that was limited to just Niles cardholders. It couldn't, nobody from another surrounding community could come in. Uh, in July, I think mid-July, we opened it up so that there were some appointments. That was when we started letting people in to browse the stacks and started letting people in to use the copiers and things like that, and to uh, we allowed non-cold card holders to have any computers that weren't in use by the card holders. If you see what I mean, Top priority went to our residents and, and other computers could be used. So it started to pick back up. And also some people, some of the residents also don't like making appointments. They like just showing up. So it's starting to come back, but as you can see, it, it has a very long way to go to get back. We don't have all of the computers being used. We switch them off and we need the social distancing. So it will be, uh, it'll be a while before this one comes back. We're limiting the number of people on that floor that can be in there. Uh, also, we do though offer Wi-Fi. You can see that when we were closed, we were getting some Wi-Fi use. People were coming and parking in the parking lot and uh, with their laptops and their phones, and they were using our Wi-Fi that way. Um, it hasn't bounced back to the extent that it did. We still don't have seating in the building, so we don't have the people here with their laptops and things using the Wi-Fi, but it's coming back some. And then the other form of technology that we use is I, I grouped everything here together. There's, uh, we have the station that you can scan, fax, or copy. And then we have the copiers and we have the printers. And so uh, that was something that I was actually very surprised by how extremely happy people were to get back to the copiers. You know, I'm a librarian and I wanted them to come back for the books. and. They came back for that copy machine, but it has always been that way. So anyway, that has come way back. And that was something I was getting phone calls about when we were closed. That was something people really missed is the ability to, 
you know, fax things to their doctor's office and things like that. And then the last category of technology, we have equipment that we rent out or that we lend out. And then we also have our, our technology spaces, the creative studios, the digital studio and the uh, maker space. And so those um, are beginning to come back very slowly. The, the circulation of the uh, um, equipment is going fine, but the use of the space is still very limited. The, uh, the digital media lab is teeny tiny and one person at a time. And, so those things, uh, a lot of that activity has gone virtual. So that is not quite back where it was, but we still uh, will be increasing, I think, our technology use when we start getting in the things that we're ordering for our age options grant, where we're getting more things for seniors to check out for equipment. And then we have our homebound. And I have to explain with this one that uh, the reason that it looks like we're still delivering uh, is that this was actually in March, April, and May, the two librarians that do the homebound delivery were calling those people because they knew that of all of the people, they were the most isolated. They were the ones that couldn't leave their houses to come to the library in the first place. So they were actually checking in with them at least once a week. And, um, and I think for some of them, it was just a real lifesaver. And they would talk books, but they would talk all sorts of other things. And then as soon as they were able to make, we gave permission for them to go deliver, which you can see took place in July. Um, that took off like crazy. Uh, however, it slipped back down a little bit in August because we aren't delivering as often as we were. We are, we're just going once a month now, not twice a month. We don't have the staffing right now to be able to do it more frequently. So programs. Uh, just so you can see the lines, the youth programs are in green, the adult programs are in yellow. Uh, teen programs stay fairly flat throughout in the blue, but keep your eye on the green and the yellow. So uh, this is the number of programs by age group, and you can see that um, it, it fell off considerably when we had to cancel everything that we had previously planned, basically. They started doing things virtually, um, but it, it wasn't the same number of programs that we had done before. Uh, but then adult really kind of was able to kick into gear and find be, be able to take some of our performers that we had used before in person, have them do things online. And so that has really bounced back pretty well. And then this one is the attendance. And this is where I think it gets a little bit more interesting. You can see that the youth is normally, you know, youth programs in a public library tend to have much, much more higher attendance than adult programs. Families are always looking for things for their kids to do. So you can see that the youth was outdoing the adult in attendance very significantly, but then the pandemic came and what we're finding is that um, it bounced back a little bit in summer reading, but uh, you can see here at the end that at this point, now that kids are going back to school and they're getting busier, the kids programming has just fallen. It's back off the cliff, really, honestly. Uh, but the adult has continued to go up. We're actually very happy with those numbers. Um, some of our adult programs are getting tremendous attendance. Not so much the digital programs, because some of those are so hands-on that uh, they just they need somebody like right over their shoulder. But the the performers and things like that, I think, and I think that age group is looking for things to do where no parents out there are looking for more screen time for their children. That is just not helpful to them. So we're doing, you know, we had like our chalk drawing activity on the retaining wall and things like that. And they, they have something planned for a, a forest preserve walk in January, but uh, the children's programming we're finding it, that's the story hours are going fantastic. They had 50 at a program last week, but the uh, but the program for older kids, that's just that's just not going to be that's not going to come back right away. And then la our, my last graph is our community meeting attendance. And of course, we're not letting them meet in our building currently so that those numbers will not come back until we feel like it's safe to have groups of people meeting in the building. And of course, uh, not until we are able to reclaim our large meeting room from being the quarantine for the books. So the last screen here is just um, to remind you what current services we do offer. We have our express checkout. We have limited computers. Uh, these are our current hours, which have not changed since the beginning. We did debate changing them recently, but with the COVID rate rising again, we thought we better just leave this where it is for now. Um, uh, people are allowed to be in the building for 45 minutes at a time. 
We have no seating, though I am excited to tell you that starting tomorrow, we're going to have four chairs out in the adult department so that you can sit down to use your laptop or sit down to look at a book. Four tables with one chair each. Uh, our programs are all still virtual. We're not doing programs in the building yet. I don't think that that's safe yet. Um, we have increased our digital resources considerably. Intra CCS borrowing has resumed so we can get things from other libraries for our patrons, not just have them rely on our own collections. And, uh, and materials right now, Rails is still requiring a seven day material quarantine. My understanding is that the state library is supposed to issue some recommendations soon and I'm hoping that it will not be for seven day quarantine. So it's seven, seven days, seven full days. Oh, wow. Yep, okay. it's forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, just uh, for the information of our new trustees, we eliminated fines early. Yes. What was it last year towards the end of last year? I can't remember when we did that exactly. Uh, so we are a fine free library. We, we levy no fine for late book. It's probably a good thing that we didn't do it because really of the thing. pandemic, but um, I can't imagine how we would, you know, go about calculating fines. We would just have to eliminate them all anyway, I think. Uh, but just for your information, that's that's how we stand. That's uh, that's our policy now. Yep. So, um, Susan, thank you very much for Welcome. the uh, statistical yep. overview. Uh, and does that does that complete it for your director's report? Obviously, you have a lot in writing that you've passed yep. out to us, but is there anything else you wanted to share with us this evening. That is um, all I have. I'm happy okay. to answer questions if anybody has any. Patty, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember who I had. I, I saw Patty first. I'll get to you next, Becky. Uh, I saw about the, um, the, the training that they're getting for passports. Yes. But still, he, there's no way the passports are opening, what, until after the first? Uh, well, we're not really up to us. It's really up to the Department of State. But yeah, that we see no signs that they are getting ready to do that anytime soon. But they, in the meantime, need to keep certified. Oh, and, definitely. And it's so detail-oriented that you really need to keep that that fresh. Without doing it, how, how you know, it's got to be hard for them. It is hard. I, I think they, uh, they try to come up with questions for each other and things like that. It's one of the at-home activities they can do, but... Yeah, it, it is. We are missing that. We're missing the income from that. And we're and it was just such a nice way to bring people into the library. So we hope that that will resume soon. OK, Becky. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, so the first one uh, refers back kind of to the overdrive and the hoopla. Yeah. But it's um, uh, it's mentioned on page four that there is a new uh, e Gale eBooks subscription. And it looks like she negotiated a great deal, but I'm just wondering how that's different from what we already have. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, Gail, we've always had a number of Gale resources and it was the Gale Virtual Library. And I don't know exactly what it is that has changed, except I think it's just a different configuration of the subscription, but that she managed to get the cost down. I don't know if there's any new database or anything in that. Yeah, I, I can find out. Okay. Um, and then the other question was, about the school outreach um, that Mikey is doing. Yeah. Uh, I think it said in here that she was going to, or working with the kids at golf school. Yes. Um, is that the school in Morton Grove? It is, and you'd be surprised. Uh, there are, there's like, I think maybe a third of the population is, uh, are belong to us. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, I know and that we live right on the borderline of the school yeah, district. Oh, okay. Too, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Diane, did I see your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify for you. Uh, Gale databases are mostly a reference type uh, book checkout kind of thing. Yeah. If, yeah, it's not the same as OverDrive at all. Yeah, thank you. Or Hoopla. I mean, Hoopla is quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Unless there's any other questions on director's report, Carolyn? Yes. Susan, um, I read in your director's report that um, you were reconsidering your hours, but now because COVID is, appears to be on the rise, you're not going to touch that. Will we then be 
driven by what the governor does? Like if he decides to close things up, we're going to close again? Is that how we'll do this? Well, we listen to him, correct? Um, how he's pursuing the future month? Well, yeah, I mean, to some extent, the thing that is different is that we have, I think, very good procedures in place right now. I think that, you know, people, staff can work relatively safely. And we are, I think, by clearing the building uh, every hour at the 45s, uh, kind of keeps people from staying. If a sick person is sick, they're not staying in the building too long at a time. Um, but if the, the rate is really kind of sharply rising right now. And so if the hospitals start to fill up around here and things like that, that's, those are the sorts of metrics that they're looking at. So it'll be a combination. The directors all, from all around are kind of comparing notes and figuring out you know, what portions of service you can try to preserve. And But if, it, if there's a stay at home order again, then I think that we're back to show, cutting the doors temporarily. I think your process has worked really well and it and it Thank seems you. that you've kind of you know stood off COVID from you know reaching so many of your uh employees which is great but I mean I listened to him and it sounds like doomsday again you know so doesn't okay. sound good no, you're right, but you, your, your setup is incredible and um thank you for all this information by the way I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Did I did anyone else have a question for our director? Okay, I just had one quick question, Susan. Uh, one concern I had about uh, closing the library every 45 minutes, I am concerned that that leaves some people waiting out in the cold that come yeah. on the bus in particular. Um, I, I have a way of getting there at exactly the wrong time and, and just sort of sitting out in my car, waiting for it to open up again so that I can run in, get a book and get out. But I really feel bad for people who might be arriving on the bus and now that the weather's getting cold, so I don't know, is it, is it possible to shorten that 15 minutes to maybe 10 minutes or something? Just Yeah, we, the supervisors and managers, we meet once a week. And we talked about that at length last, the last couple of, of meetings because, you know, it is getting to be the colder weather. And, um, and you know, the greeters outside were starting to break down and go, oh, there was this little old lady out there and she looked so cold. So I let her in the vestibule. And, and so... Uh, we just had to kind of iron that out and decide what our process was going to be. And so um, what we figured is that most people are coming in their cars and those people, you know, it's not convenient, but they still can sit in their cars. We are a little concerned about the people coming in on the bus. Um, and so Dave is going to be working on coming up with a, at least like a windscreen or something to get them uh, to not be directly in the in the blowing. Um, it, but yeah, I really, we considered all the different possibilities of could we do it just for 10 minutes or for five minutes? But basically it's, um, we think what would happen is people would just stay in the library if we don't like make it a real clearing of the library where it's visible if a patron is there. Um, and then the CDC did just change the definition today of the of the close contact from being 15 minutes talking to a person at once mm -hmm. to being 15 minutes over 24 hours. And that's where a lot of your sort of short conversations with patrons could add up. So um, I'm hesitant to change it when I can see that the rates are going up, but uh, but we definitely are taking it seriously. We, uh, I know Dave is also yeah, trying to get it. I was wondering if those uh, bus, bus patrons could wait in the vestibule. Yeah, we, we talked one, about that, but the problem is, them. With the spacing, you could only get four people in, and and you have to get be positioned in just the right place so that you're not standing in a place that makes the doors open. And uh, and I want the staff, I want the staff member who's greeting to be able to use the vestibule and not have people crowding in around them. So we did think about it, but um, and and if it, you know, there may be circumstances where we end up having to do that when it gets really really cold. But you know. Mm -hmm. But for right yeah. now, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And Dave is, is trying to get a kind of patio heater um, that would also help with that, but he has not been able to get one so far. Those are you know, sold out everywhere. But yeah, we definitely are thinking about it. Umair, you had your hand up? Yeah, so, so one thing I wanted to ask about was in the director's report, um, you mentioned the numbers. And I, I know you're following the state, so it's not, you know, not really in your hands anyway. But the numbers you mentioned were percentage of positive test cases. Correct. 
Um, and so my thought is, and just, again, I'm not an epidemiologist or anything of, of that sort, but wouldn't it make sense to track absolute number of cases within the, so for example, Illinois had six, you know, it has, I think the highest number of cases in the past week that it did since I think the end of May. Yeah. So it would seem to me that the number of act, you know, the percentage of cases is based on, is based on um, how many people actually go and get tested, but the number of positive cases, that's more of a, this is an absolute number. You know, there's 2000 people or, you know, 500 people in our community who are currently infected and contagious and we can say verifiably that they are. So we want to minimize the chance. So I'm not sure again, what numbers are, are being considered most important, but to me, it seemed like that the absolute value number, just the total number of cases in within the district or within the zip code or within whatever um, is going to be the most important number to consider yeah. um, when making these determinations. And again, not saying that that's not the number you're considering, but just wanted to uh, yeah. make that point. I, yeah, I do have that number. That That's the zip code map that I look at every day has the total number of cases and then the percentage of the right. positive cases of the people tested. But um, I do have a staff member who is actually tracking not just this zip code and 60016, but uh, yeah. also the zip codes of the different places that staff members live in case anybody oh, wants right. to know how their own neighborhood is doing. And <laughs> right. she's just got a running track of how many cases there have been. The thing that's hard to know is a sort of cumulative who's sick now. That's right. the piece I really don't have. I, well, that would well, be a great one. That's where the one week data comes in, right? Or one yeah. week, two weeks. They say it's, you know, it's contagious for two to three weeks or whatever that, I mean, again, I don't know that yeah. doctors have different opinions on this, yeah. but for however long it's contagious, if you say, well, you know, within the past two weeks, this many people tested positive, yeah. then you can say, okay, approximately this many people, or maybe double that if we say there are a bunch of people untested. Um, you know, are actually contagious actively right now in the community. If somebody had it three months ago, yeah. that doesn't really change the right, calculus right. of what we should do today. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Good um, thought. Unless there's any other uh, questions of Susan, uh, the next thing on the agenda is communications, although that was a short part of your report, Susan. I think it's like yeah, on page 13. I, I don't yeah. know that you have anything to add to that, do you? Nope. Okay, all right, then moving on to new business, uh, discussion to determine the amount of the 2020 uh, tax levy. So uh, this is uh, in an, um, an important discussion that we need to have. Um, are there any uh, preliminary remarks that you or Greg would like to make before we um, begin here? Uh, no, I, I just remind you that um, what we feel our job is, is to present you with the information and for you to make the determination. We don't ever make a recommendation. We, we, uh, we give you, we're happy to give you whatever configuration of, you know, if we did this, how would it look then? But, the, but that truly is a board decision. So we're happy to support you in whatever way we can. And we certainly will let you know what our needs are as we understand them. But, um, but, you know, Greg has, as always, an excellent presentation to give you that's got kind of the background information that we think you're going to need. So I'll just turn over to Greg. All right, Greg. Thanks. Um, thanks, Susan. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, if you just, uh, oh, it's disabled, Susan. Can you? I just now did it. Yeah, go ahead. Did you? Okay. Uh, oh, great. There it is. And we'll share that. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, property tax levy. Uh, this, um, this should be somewhat familiar. It follows the same uh, format as um, in the previous years, uh, for those of you who were around last year. Okay, so property tax revenue, uh, I'm sorry, property tax revenue is uh, the most important thing to our operations as it as it uh, provides 95% of our total revenue. Uh, by comparison, if you look at the Village of Niles or the Niles Park District, uh, Village of Niles, it's about 11% and the Niles Park District is around half, depending on what year you're looking at. Um, 
Oh, and just to um, go back, uh, this is even more important this year because uh, some of our revenue streams have been reduced because of uh, the pandemic and actions like uh, eliminating fines. So it's even, even higher uh, this year than it has been in previous years. Um, if we look back to the 2019 property tax levy, um, that's the levy that was collected during calendar 2020. The first installment is in February. And this year, the second installment uh, was in August, but uh, the state extended the, uh, the due time, the due date until October. Uh, so it's technically a late payment, but with no interest. And uh, we probably got most of our um, levy funds in August and we've had maybe about 20 or 30 percent of the second installment come in uh, during October. Uh, looking back again to the 2019 levy, it was almost 13 percent less than the previous year. The final levy was uh, 6,893,725 and then the board um, decided to abate a million dollars. I believe it was in May last year uh, so the net was 5,983.25. Uh, but the way that the county works is they add 3% uh, for loss and costs, as they say. So the actual aggregate extension grand total was 6,166,000. Um, so the 2020, 2021 uh, budget used the final net levy for the entire year. When we budget, I don't assume that there's going to be an increase or a decrease or anything else. I just basically run it out as if it's the same uh, year over year. And of course, the board, uh, we're asking the board to set the 2020 levy, which will be collected in uh, February and August of 2021. Okay, so there are a few things that are uh, different this year. Um, the pandemic has influenced us uh, to a great degree. It's reduced the availability to patrons. We're probably uh, open for only two thirds of the hours that were normally open. Um, and uh, uh, operations are less efficient uh, due to the quarantine. We're handling materials multiple times where in the past, if somebody checked in a book, they could check it in through the uh, automated materials handler and it would be pre-sorted. Now what we're doing is a manual uh, collection into a quarantine room where they're put onto a cart and then they're, um, and then they're put through the uh, uh, automated materials uh, 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 sorter after the uh, quarantine period is up. We've also had lower revenue um, uh, uh, this year. Uh, as I said, uh, fines were eliminated on April 1st, 2020. Um, passports, used book sales, pay for print are all less this year due to availability. Um, you know, basically across the board, all of those are zero at this point um, since, since we've uh, eliminated passports according to the State Department guidelines. The used book sales have been taken down and replaced with new materials. And pay for print is, as you saw in Susan's numbers, it's increasing, but it's still far behind the previous year. Uh, also, investment income. Uh, which was about $240,000 last year, uh, is much smaller due to the uh, fixed income market collapse. Uh, right now, interest rates on a short-term basis are 0%, uh, essentially 0.1%. And if you go out uh, if you go out five years, you might be able to get zero, uh, uh, 0 0.50 percent, so half a percent over five years. And what what we're seeing happen is we uh, some of our investments that we've made in CDs and and treasuries and and bonds ha um, at a, a much higher rate, like three percent or or more are coming uh, due and are, are being paid back to us. And then the reinvestment is at a much lower level. There was a one-time uh, tax increment financial district payment of $195,000 that will not reoccur this year. Um, it was, this was something that we talked about in this presentation last year as a forecasting. And we ended up getting it in the uh, early part of the year. I think we got some in January and then some in March 
um, for a total of $195,000. And this has to do with the closure of the Milwaukee Tui uh, TIF. And then of course, we had a one-time tax abatement in May of $1 million that was uh, made in um, against the uh, 2019 levy. Considerations for uh, the current property tax levy. Our expenses tend to grow at a compounded annual growth rate in the neighborhood of 2.7%. Um, the special revenue funds, which is a part of our levy, uh, run with near, nearly zero fund balances. Um, when I started with the library, we had uh, almost $1.4 million and we've been very careful to draw those down so we don't have a lot of money uh, locked up in funds for special purposes that are can only be spent for those special purposes. Uh, there are four new uh, TIF districts in the uh, uh, in the uh, village, uh, which will result in um, in lost revenue as their valuations increase and the incremental taxes actually get um, uh, uh, put into those uh, vehicles. Um, they, we had the planned close of the Milwaukee Tui TIF, which I mentioned um, in a previous slide. And then we got $195,000 uh, during the uh, latter half of the fiscal year. Uh, and then typically we have growth and expansion and current services. We wanna get back to where we were. Um, we have limited services now and we want to uh, reopen different parts of the library so that we can uh, get back to uh, our footing. Uh, pre-pandemic and uh, we're due for uh, strategic planning uh, and what that'll bring in the um, in the near future. So if you look at the history of the uh, of our tax levy um, you can see that the blue line uh, or the blue block represents the money that goes into our general fund. Um, and then the orange block represents the funds that go into our special revenue funds. And then the top of the top boundary of the uh, orange block uh, represents the total of the levy uh, that you could see in the uh, chart just to the right. Um, the, um, uh, the 2019 levy at 5 million uh, plus almost 6 million, of course, was net of a one-time uh, abatement. And over um, the past uh, several years, going back to 2012, we've had three decreases, two increases, and two years where we didn't change. And then if you look at the, levy, at the point of the levy compared to 2012, we decreased 19.1%. Um, the state CPI limitation, if we had taken advantage of that year over year, would have seen an increase of 11.2% over the same period. So you could see that we're about 30% in total, if you add the 19.1 and the 11.2, uh, 30% where we could have been had we just taken an increase of CPI every year. <clears throat> Here's a, a, a projection uh, which shows the um, uh, general fund from uh, 2015 uh, and then extended out to uh, 2023, 24. Um, all of the numbers that are under headings that don't have the E are actual. Um, and then estimates for 2020, 2021 um, are what uh, the budget shows. And from 2021, 22 forward, um, we show the reinstatement of the uh, million dollars because it was only a one year um, abatement of $1 million uh, that, we, that the board uh, voted on. And then of course we grow expenditures by the compounded annual growth rate of 2.7 percent. Here's what it looks like uh, as a graph. The orange line is the fund expenditures and you could see generally it's kind of a kind of a smooth line um, and the general fund uh, revenue you could see this dip right here which is represented by the one million dollar uh, one million dollar abatement and then going back up 
a million dollars to uh, this point uh, going forward. Here's another look at the general fund projection. Um, and I, what I wanted to show is what it would look like if the revenue uh, line stayed at a million, included a million dollar abatement year over year going forward. So if you look at uh, 2021, uh, I'm sorry, 2020, 2021, um, these numbers are exactly up to this point are exactly what appeared on the previous slide. And then we just used the 5 million 514 uh, for the out years in, in the estimate. And you could see what that, rev what that revenue level does to us. We we're pretty much break even in, in 21, 22. And then the, the losses uh, start, the annual losses start to grow in, in the years uh, following that. And that's due primarily to the growth in, in the general fund expenditures at a compounded annual growth rate of 2.7%. And here's what that looks like. Um, you know, the big difference here is instead of this curve rebounding up to this level, it just kind of stays flat and you could see the expenditures uh, crossing over. Uh, special revenue funds. Uh, special revenue funds are, we have six of them, and those are parts of uh, the tax levy which have been levied for a very specific purpose and can only be spent on that purpose. So for um, our audit costs, we have a levy. For our social security insurance and, and Medicare, we have a levy, as well as for liability insurance, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, and then uh, building and site. And that's for, you know, like maintenance contracts and, and uh, things of that nature. Um, our annual spending needs for these are in the five hundred to six hundred thousand dollar a year uh, range. Um, in the current budget year, uh, it amounts to approximately five hundred and forty-five thousand dollars. And what we try to do is is only levy for what we need so that we can uh, stay as close to zero because if we need money, I don't want, nobody would want it tied up in a fund where you can only buy, for example, uh, unemployment compensation. You'd much rather have flexibility that the uh, general fund gives you. In terms of fiscal management, we try to look at the long-term um, horizon, try to look into the future. Uh, we try to build uh, reserves for large projects, such as major repairs or large scale renovations. Everybody remembers the renovation that we had in uh, 2013, 2014. And that cost, if uh, just to remind you, was approximately $5.5 million. Um, we, we look at stability year over year. We try to manage by increments to avoid significant increases or decreases. Um, significant increases, of course, are a shock to the taxpayers and significant decreases are a shock to the library and could make the library permanently smaller and unable to fill its mission um, uh, if, you know, under the uh, current set of rules governing property taxes and, and, and how they uh, are allowed to change from year to year. Um, we try to work within, uh, we don't try, we work within the laws of the state of Illinois. Um, the starting point for this year is the unabated uh, tax levy of 7166523 which is actually the extension uh, grand total, which as I mentioned, uh, the state adds in loss and costs of about 3%. That's why it's a little bit bigger than um, than the number you saw uh, previously. Um, just reminding everybody that the $1 million abatement of uh, 2019 taxes was uh, uh, presented as a one-time abatement when it was uh, voted on in um, uh, May of uh, this year. Uh, the law has also established guardrails on the property tax levy. The levy may increase by the lesser of 5% or the change in CPI. Uh, the state every year tells us what the change in CPI is, so everybody's working with the same number. And this year, the change in CPI is 2.3%, uh, which means that using a base of 7,166,523, 
and applying the 2.3% to it, that the potential increase uh, is 164,830. Uh, increases that are more significant must be accomplished by referendum, which means that the community is presented with a set of uh, facts and a choice to make, and they, and they get the vote at, um, at an election. Uh, decreases to the levy, of course, are unlimited. Uh, but in the year following the decrease, uh, the levy may be increased to its previous level. Uh, it's a shock to the library in one year, and it's a shock to the taxpayers in the following year. And again, permanent decreases can make the library smaller or unable to accomplish its mission. Cash and investments as of September 30th, 2020. If you look at the balance sheet that was presented in your package, uh, we have total funds of 11,259,451. Um, we've just finished collecting the second installment for 2019. Uh, you'll see the last of that in, in the October financials. It's a small amount. Uh, the next uh, tax installment is in February and March. Um, the library needs about Five hundred to five hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year uh, to uh, to function and uh, to cover operating expenses through February. The library will need somewhere between two and a half, two point eight million dollars uh, to cover five months of expenses looking forward. Um, we uh, had a um, list of uh, capital. Um, expense items uh, that was presented to the board last year, they amounted to $3,585,848. Um, these expenses uh, will come out of the Special Reserve Fund. Uh, that balance right now is $3,858,008. And um, that's due to a $3 million transfer uh, during the last uh, fiscal year. So, um, you know, it seems like we're okay, but there's very little potential, uh, there's very little extra for a potential renovation in five to 10 years, which would put our current renovation at the 15 to 20 year old uh, mark. We should probably consider what that might look like in the future. Um, 184,819 is the fund balance and the special reserve funds. Uh, which of course, as I said before, can only be uh, spent for an intended purpose. And that leaves uh, 4,688,784, that is uh, unreserved or approximately 75 expenses, uh, except for capital improvements. So the way we get there is 11,259,451, less 2,008,000, less 3,585,000, less, uh, 184,819, um, which is uh, a nice reserve uh, to have, but guards against uh, service disruptions. As you know, as uh, we started to see when the um, when our uh, pandemic started to uh, really take hold, and we weren't sure if we were actually going to get any of the uh, second installment until you know for some period of time. So, you know, having uh, money on hand allows us to continue to operate uh, and provide services to our patrons so that we can, uh, you know, we can stay in business and uh, keep everything intact. And that's it. So if we have, uh, if we have questions, um, please let me know. Um, can you um, take the, take that down for a second, just so I can see everyone. Otherwise I can't see if anyone has their hand up. Uh, first of all, Greg, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. There's a lot of information in that. It, could you possibly email that out to us so that we could look at it and sort of digest that information? Of course. Okay, fine. Um, I have some questions, but um, I'm going to just look around the uh, virtual room here and see if anyone else has their hand up regarding any questions that they might have. I don't you, see Greg. anyone immediately. Uh, I'm sorry, Linda, did you have something? I wanted to say thank you so much for that, Greg. You're welcome. Um, I have a question. Uh, so, Greg, um, we know that the library, when it's operating, has a lot of fixed costs that uh, aren't affected by the pandemic, but are there some cost savings that we have experienced that we anticipate uh, experiencing in the months going forward because of the changes that we've had to make? 
Yeah, we've had um, we've had some small wins. Um, you know, we've seen our utilities uh, uh, decrease from uh, previous year levels because of the, of the shorter hours. Um, you know, it's incredible uh, when you look at energy consumption of the building. Uh, it's pretty low until they turn on the heat or the air conditioning and fire up the big uh, uh, air handlers, and and then you know it triples or quadruples to uh, what it was previously. So, given that you know we have shorter hours, we're seeing um, we're seeing uh, a lesser amount of electricity consumed uh, in comparison year over year. Um, we've also uh, saw a, um, uh, a $10,000 return of premium from our um, uh, workers' compensation uh, provider, um, you know, because we've, you know, we've had some, we have had some lower wages and on audit, you know, they've uh, returned some of those funds to us. So, you know, um, you know, Small wins, um, but I wouldn't say anything huge. I mean, we're we're running pretty uh, inefficiently right now. You know, as I said, just on on circulating materials by itself, it takes multiple uh, handles, if you will, multiple touches to get a book. You know, from uh, a patron's hands back on the shelf, where before, uh, you know, it was uh, basically uh, one touch where we would take the book out of the sorter, we would put it on a cart and push that cart, you know, to the, uh, to the shelf and put it on the shelf. So, you know, there's, there's small wins, but, you know, there's inefficiencies, I think, which are offsetting it to a degree. Okay, all right, any other questions? I have a few. Okay, Carolyn. Actually, I was looking at our utilities and I can't find it now, but I thought it was somewhere in the number of 8,000, which I thought was a bit high um, because, well, well let, let, let me start off with, um, we looked at Susan's information and um, she gave us an indication of where we are now during this pandemic and where we were before all of this hit. And I think what we need to realize is our programs and services that used to be in the building are dramatically cut. We no longer mm -hmm. offer um, passports and we invested a great deal of time and money and training staff just for that specific purpose. And um, that's one thing that we need to look at in terms of if we've lost so much of our services and programs, how is it that our operating costs really are at the same level? I mean, there's a lot to be delved into here. Um, and I sort of don't agree that even though we're open two thirds of the time, we're spending just as much. I mean, that, that's, that's a generalization and I think it needs to definitely be backed up with some data. But moving on to a couple other things, we're closed on Sundays um, and we had decided to pay an additional amount for those salaries. We no longer have um, passport services and yet we have these staff, which I assume are they helping with the multi touches of the books. And while that sounds more, more hands-on than it was, I don't think it's to the point where we can justify saying our budget or our cost for the year is anywhere near what it was last year. Um, I also have some questions. Greg, I was listening to your figures. I took my figures for the funds, the, um, the general fund, the special reserve and revenues off this, um, balance sheet. Are you using like year-to-date numbers? Is that why yours are lower? Uh, which number specifically, Carolyn? Can you point me to the a... fund? Like my general fund figure from, I'm using the balance sheet from September 30th. Uh -huh. So is that why my numbers are higher than yours? No, I use those numbers. Okay. 
you ended up with 13, no, I ended up with 13 million total. You ended up with 11. Uh -huh. So I'm trying to figure out where the difference is. And then I have a different, I have 500,000 in revenues, in special revenues, and you only have 183. So I was wondering why. Yeah. Am so if, if I may. Um, so I, I believe what you're doing is looking at the very uh, bottom of the balance sheet, um, which is a line that says total liabilities and fund balance, which uh, sum uh, for the organization on a consolidated basis of $13,980,630. What I was trying to do in the, in the slides in the latter part of the uh, presentation is look at the cash we have on hand. So if you look up on the rightmost column, third line where it says total cash and investments, yeah, that's 11,259,451. So the other 2 million is not readily available, but is that the monies that you showed us when we had our levy discussion that I think I don't know if they're CDs or treasuries that they're they become available every month for different amounts. Is is that what that two million is? Is that the what difference? That, uh, there is no two million. Uh, there's only eleven well, million. You're saying that cash on hand is eleven million, but mm -hmm. according to the balance sheet, once we take out liabilities, we have thirteen million. Uh -uh. That, that includes that, that includes liabilities, Carolyn. Thirteen million. That includes liabilities. So the 13 million um, is an accumulation of total liabilities of 3,244,604 and fund balance of 10,736,026. So liabilities aren't subtracted from our assets? Well, if you subtracted the liabilities from our assets, then you're given a fund balance of 10,736,026. 10, well, that's what I'm trying to come up with. Considering our assets and our liabilities, what's available? Not the, not the total liabilities and fund balance. That's an, and that's, I'm misunderstanding that statement. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. we, we have 11,259,451, which is the cash and investments that the library holds. Okay, and what about the receivables? Well, Property the receivables. Uh, the receivables are offset by deferred revenues down below. So you see that uh, property tax receivables are two million two seventy four five thirty one. Right. Uh, but when um, when we collect that, it appear you know it um, uh, applies to the latter half of the year, which is six months uh, past our uh, six months past our uh, fiscal year end. So. Uh, this year, we actually we actually uh, received more money faster than we should have because of the abatement, and our deferred revenues for the second half of the year is two million nine sixty three nine oh three. So think of it: uh, you just sold your house. So think of it in those terms. When you sold your house and you did the closing, um, you ended up uh, giving a credit for the number of months that you lived in your house that uh, up to the point of sale um, so that your buyer could uh, would only be paying taxes from that day forward. And of course it was an estimate, it's not exact uh, because of the way that these numbers tend to work. Okay, forgive me, but that's confusing me. Okay, so are you saying because we get our revenues after or later, you're deducting that from the total amount available? Is that how you're trying to explain that? No, I'm simply taking the uh, uh, the amount of cash and investments that we currently have on the September 30th uh, balance sheet of 11,259,451. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you are not considering the, um, the receivables because of when we receive them? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not considering the receivables because if you look down below, there's a line called deferred revenue, which mm -hmm. basically says that, which is an offset to those uh, receivables. Actually, it more than offsets it by $700,000. Okay. 
But why is it an offset? We are receiving it. Why are we offsetting it? Um, because um, let's say, let's pretend that the library goes out of business on, uh, on June 30th. Okay. We'll have not collected $2.2 million, but the $3 million down below is what we'll actually owe property tax owners or property owners. Okay, so you're, we're talking cash investments. We're talking about receivables, and then because we have to, we have liabilities, somehow you're subtracting it. So the bottom line, total liabilities and fund balances, is incorrect. It's not 13 mil. You're saying 11. That's fine. I'll accept that. You, and then uh, you, no, 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 no. That's absolutely the wrong way to look at it. The 11 million pertains only to one part of the balance sheet, and that's the cash and investments at the top, 11 million, right. 259, 451. Okay, and what else so, could um, we do? Karen, as as just uh, for, for a minute, you know, uh, what we're trying to focus on right now is the levy, and yeah, uh, what we want to do on going on forward. That figure. So we have 11 million in investments. We do yeah. get taxes, we get revenue, are we not going to include that in the total? Well, we don't get any more cash from investments until February. I'm, I'm sorry, you, I, I cash from, from property taxes until February. But I know they come in February, but they're, they're part of this year's money that we're going to have, correct? Um, they're part of this year, yes. Okay, that's fine. Let's just let it go. I, I get what you're saying. All right, I had a couple other questions. Um, Do these relate to the prospective levy? Absolutely. Uh, Greg, you mentioned that um, we received the TIF. It totaled $195,000. You mentioned that the payments came in January and March. We I actually, believe so. yes. we, actually, we actually received the second half of that payment. I think it was... 123,000 and it was in June, still last year, but that money wasn't even mentioned in our budget preparation. So it still is part of our, our, our cash on hand. So it is still monies that we can look at as benefiting us as opposed to paying some of our expenses, correct? So that, that, that money that was received, first of all, was mentioned in this presentation last year. I forecasted it because I had been warned about it and uh, offered it to uh, the board as a part one of the considerations in setting the levy for the upcoming year. Uh, second of all, um, that money, as it has been received and is in our accounts, is actually contained in the 11 million 259 451 uh, cash and investment total at the end of September. Okay, great. Because I, it sounded like as if it wasn't there, but we did receive a good portion of it later. So I would assume, yes, we can count on that. Um, then I had another question. Um, you said our investments in 2019 were $240,000 but interest rates have changed and our income will be affected. Do we know what our income will be this year? No. What's the loss that we're, or, or the decrease we're anticipating? Well, um, so we have some investments that are, pay, are paying like three or 3.25%. 3 when those come due and are put into our account, the reinvestment rates, are well below 1% and hover uh, around 0.01% for very short term up to 0.5% for, uh, for a five year uh, investment. So, um, you know, it will be a lot less. Uh, this year um, in the budget documents, we, um, we estimated that it would be about $75,000. Would be all that we received. Okay, thank you. And, okay. Um, then, and then you mentioned growth. Carly, um, do you Excuse have me. more questions that, that actually relate to the levy here? Uh, they do. It's to what he just told us. I have questions about how we're going to be calculating the levy. You mentioned growth expansion and current services. 
I, I would just like to point out, um, we're in the middle of a pandemic and um, you know the library has come back slowly, nowhere near to where it was. And it sounds like we're gonna go back into hibernation. So I, I don't see that expansion is something even on the horizon. If, if we can bounce back even to the level we are at now, once we end up shutting down again, it won't be till summer, which will be the end of this fiscal year. So I, I just want to be careful about, I know, you know, I think it's, it's great to have plans and vision, but I think we need to identify where we are right now. Um, and again, the, um, the situation, the economy is a disaster. So we, we need to realize just with the library, what can we do that will benefit the residents but definitely help us to curtail spending. I can't believe our spending should be anywhere near where it was during a good year. But I just wanted to mention that because I know you, you talked about growth. And, um, and then let's see, I had one other question. Um, Carolyn, while you're looking for that, I think, Diane, did you have your hand up or was I mistaken? Questions, excuse me. Um, okay. I had some questions um, regarding what I thought, maybe items that we could consider. Um, I know I brought this up before, but we now have two new trustees who may find an interest. Um, I'd like to see us delve into our expenses and see what we can eliminate that we don't need. And of course, one of the items that keeps popping up is the Culver parking lot, which I think we pay about $10,000 a year and we don't use it. Um, I'd like to see us just eliminate that contract, at least now. That's 10 grand we certainly can use for other things. And then um, another issue is our publication of chapter one. Uh, I know we tried to kind of reinvent it when, um, when COVID-19 hit to let all the residents know we were still here, but maybe we should consider going online since our largest portion of, of um, interaction is online. And you know, that's another 50,000, but I'm coming from a position where I think we should, we should take a, a, a slower approach with more data in terms of where we really stand and what can we do to equal our costs to the pandemic that we're, we're currently in. Okay, thank you, I'm finished. All right, Carolyn. Becky, I saw your hand up next. Patty, I'll get to you. But Becky had her hand up for a minute there. Yeah, I just wanna give a, a little background, I guess, on I, my take of the spending is currently uh, for libraries during the pandemic, I see the expenses being nearly the same because the building is open and all the expenses that come with having a building open are the same. Uh, the staff is all working, so that's all the same. Material purchases are all the same. Um, in fact, there's probably an increase in what we're spending on e-materials because that has gone up so much. Um, so I really don't think that the expenditures should be all that much different. Um, all of what I do foresee possibly in the future, if, especially if we do have to close again, would be possibly um, getting mobile hotspots. And if we have a significant amount of the population that does not have Wi-Fi, that is something that we need to offer them. And there are different ways being floated mm -hmm. around the library community uh, right now, as far as you know, possibly having the van go out with hotspots to different locations. And that would be a cost that we might have to incur as well. Can okay, I? Thank you, Becky. I, uh, well, Mayor, uh, Patty had her hand up. I'll come to you next, okay? Sure. Patty, you had your hand up before? Thank you. First of all, as far as three, two at least of her things she brought up, meaning Carolyn, they were things that were discussed in the budget. The budget is set. Number one is the magazine or the flyer or whatever you want to call it, chapter one. I feel as a senior now that it's important because I'm not totally comfortable with the internet and this. Zoom meeting, oh my God, whoever thought I'd be doing this. 
so there are a lot of people who have even less technical knowledge than I that are seniors. We are supposed to be helping our seniors by cutting back, like you are saying, to me where that goes against our seniors. Number two, what was the other one? There were two things you said. The last one you brought up, especially, you're trying to bring up budget, which until we have the budget talk, which will be in the spring or January, whenever we want to start bringing it up, that's already dealt with. So I don't feel bringing up budget stuff when the budget is already set, it's a done deal. And it kind of annoys me that you have a tendency to bring up the budget after it's been decided quite often. Thank okay. you. All right, Omer, you had your hand up and then Linda, I'll get to you. So I just wanna support what uh, Becky had to say and you know, add the fact she works at a library. We have to rely on the expertise that we have on this board to, to uh, you know, advise the board. I don't work at a library. I did mm -hmm. 25 years ago, but you know, she works at a library today. She's giving you reasons why what Greg is telling us is spot on and here's why. So I think we have to, we have to have the, uh, I guess, the discipline, I would say, to defer to that expertise. Now, Greg, with all due respect, it's our job to question you. I mean, that, that's, what, that's why we're here. But when we have somebody on our board who is saying, yes, everything that, that is being said is accurate and valid for these reasons, I, for one, want to defer to that expertise and say, okay, you know what? Uh, I may not fully understand it 100% because I'm not in that environment where I'm managing that budget on a day-to-day -day basis. At the same time, because we do have that expertise on the board, we should, we should give some deference to that expertise. In law, uh, they would call it uh, Chevron deference. Yeah, no offense uh, taken uh, for any questions, believe me. All right, Linda, you had your hand up. But you have to unmute yourself and otherwise we cannot hear your questions. Thank you. <laughs> All right, yes, I also wanted to piggyback on that and just add a few things. Um, I, I just think that the perception sometimes is that the library is spending less or needs less because um, they have less in-person hours um, but what everyone has to remember, the library has still been open. I mean, you have to remember that. That's I think that's really key for our patrons to remember um, that it's still open um, for everyone to use all of our materials and we're spending it differently because of the pandemic. Um, so our salaries are still the same. And that's, as we know, as Greg just pointed out, that is our biggest chunk. So that has not changed. Um, I think we've, we're very proud of that. We're, you know, trying to keep everyone on the status quo, not hurting anyone through this pandemic. Um, same that Becky had said, library materials. We still have programming. Yes, Carolyn is correct. It looks differently. We do see it in our chapter one. We know it's not the same. We may not be spending the same amount of money, but as you can see in the director's report, we're doing a heck of a lot and I'm actually very proud of it. Um, it's really innovative and it's amazing what our staff has been doing. Um, so with that being said, I don't think there's much money there either to say we aren't spending. Either it might be a small portion, but that might be the only portion, but that's a very minuscule part of our budget. What I'm concerned about towards levy going forward um, our passport revenue is down. Okay, so we're not getting that. So we have to remember that we counted on that money once we, you know, had that in our budget. So that's, um, I believe, what was that, 20,000 that we have in there for? No, for much time? more than that, uh, close to 60. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, worse than I thought, I don't know what I read here, 20, maybe I was looking at, I don't know what I was looking at. Okay, so that's, okay, so that's money that we're not getting. Um, property tax not paid due to unemployment. That we're not sure of, just like Greg said, we don't really know what we're gonna be getting in. So we have to really be careful because 
Um, remember at the end of the year, we might have to actually give money back for, to companies too, you know, we had that um, issue. The TIF districts, again, we have to worry about that with commercial revenue, revenue that's down, no fines. Well, we've already talked about that, had that. Our abatement, which was, um, you know, we all voted on $1 million. Um, however, you know, that also put us in a lower a bracket. Again, what Greg pointed out is the interest investment. Last year, we did really well. Greg had made us what, what was it like double or triple from the year before, Greg? You had yeah, it was about 240,000, I think. You did amazing in our investments last year, um, if I recollect. And um, it's just not going to be able to happen this year. Um, let's see. And, and then I'm worried about the growth rate of expenditures of 2.7. So when I look at everything combined, I just really have to make a thoughtful decision on. on on where I stand with the levy, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Linda. Everyone has had a chance to uh, make some remark about um, the levy. Uh, Diane, did you want to add anything or um, have other people said pretty much what you wanted to? I'll leave that up to you if you want to add anything. Uh, I pretty much agree with the last two statements. Um, I was looking at my notes here um, I believe that, Greg, you said the change in the CPI is 2.3%. Correct. Right? Yes. And uh, the potential increase would equal $164,830. Yeah, that's over a base of uh, $7,166,000. Okay, so does uh, help me... It, understand this is uh, does that mean that's um, how do we determine how much an increase in tax levy would be for our residents? So um, what happened last year is the board of trustees uh, passed a levy ordinance and the levy ordinance was equal to about $6.9 million or so. When the state added, I'm sorry, when the county added what's called loss and costs at about 3%, it ended up being about 7166000 um, The board then decided to uh, uh, pass an abatement ordinance for $1 million. So the effective extension total is 6166000 Okay. At the time that that was passed, um, there were, you know, the, the board passed it and announced that it was a one-time abatement, which means that if you, if you take that to heart and you operate that, that you're already starting at 7,166. Now, at this point, the board has a couple of decisions that they could possibly make. Um, they could, uh, you guys could decide to take that 7,166 and add 2.3% to it, which would um, make it about 7,320 and change. If, if, if I'm not doing the math fast enough, I don't think. Um, and uh, that would be the new grand extension. Um, the other thing that you can do is keep it flat and basically say, you know, the five or the six million nine something that we had at the, at the, uh, in the last levy felt right to us. Sorry. Yeah. So since uh, that million dollars was a one year thing, you, you could set it back to uh, the 2019 level. Uh, which was, I said, as I said, six million nine twenty three or something like that. I can get you the exact number. Uh, the third thing that you could do is uh, is reduce it. And I guess there's a fourth thing. You know, uh, just like uh, the board decided to abate taxes last year, uh, you could pass a levy at you know at some amount, and after the uh, 
uh, after the close of the calendar year, you could see how the first few months go and then decide to abate once again um, at the same amount or at a different amount. Right. So, so you know, that's, that's basically the, um, the set of solutions that's before you. So thank you, Greg. Um, what we are going to do right now is go around the room, and I want each one of you to tell me what you think is appropriate for us to do in terms of the levy. And taking off right from what Greg said right now, we do have options. We can raise the level up to 2.3%, the levy. It doesn't have to be that amount. It could be something less than that. We can keep it flat with 2019, that is no chains or up and down from the 2019 levy, uh, what we passed last year for this year, um, or we can reduce it. And again, the amount that we can reduce it can be various levels. Umara, I'm gonna to get to you in just a minute, but let me let me just finish this. Sure. I just so wanna like, I have a question before you go around. Okay. Um, and the fourth option, if Greg is correct, we could do one of a number of things that I just mentioned, and then in a few months after we see things, how our things are going, uh, we could abate it. But we can't decide about an abatement tonight. Uh, that is a possibility down the road, but uh, we cannot say tonight, we're gonna make the levy this and we're gonna abate it in five or six months down the road. We may think that's what we're gonna do and we may in fact do that, but we don't know exactly what's gonna happen down the road. And I might add, um, let's see, as of May of next year, there will be uh, possibly uh, a number of new board members too. So we can't, uh, we can't guess what those board members might want to do also after that point in time. So the only thing we can do right now uh, is decide to keep the same, raise it, or reduce it. I mean, and we can also say it would might be my preference to do one thing and to do it, but we can't guarantee that uh, we will in fact abate five or six months from now. That's something we would have to vote on later on. And we might want to see you know, how, how events progress between now and then, and that might uh, make our decision about the abatement. Certainly last year, it never occurred to us uh, when we passed the levy, I think it was around December 1st, that what would happen? It never occurred to us that we would need to abate the levy as we ultimately decided we would have to do. So what we're doing tonight, well, Mary, I haven't forgotten you, I'll get back to you. But what we're gonna do tonight is we're not passing the levy, but we're giving our administrators our collective opinion as to what we want the levy to be so that they can prepare the paperwork so that at a future meeting, we can actually pass the levy. And Greg, do you want to just tell us a little bit about the timing for this, for uh, passing the levy? Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Susan, but I think uh, uh, to pass the levy, uh, we, the deadline is like the fourth Tuesday in November or oh something my. like that. Really? It's December. Uh, it might be December 1st or like the fourth Tuesday in, um, we have to do it in November in yeah. order to basically um i do i do recall we have to do it at a november meeting i think yeah but um, i you know I, I i thought it was expressed as you know like you know the nth date the nth yeah. day of I, I have this on a schedule someplace but i'm afraid i don't for, have it in front of me Susan, for the, yeah. i do have it in front of me for this year it is the statutory deadline is december 1st 2020. okay okay, okay fine all right well, Mary. Yeah, so my Omar, question is... I'm sorry, is, Omar, I'm saying your name wrong. I'm sorry, Omar. Yes, go ahead. Omar? Okay. No worries. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, you know, for Becky and my benefit, um, just the mechanics of how the abatement was passed. Was the abatement passed this May after the pandemic started? That's what I'm gathering? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to understand. So the levy was assessed at the level of the 6.9, and then when the pandemic hit, we said, oh, wait, economy is tanking. Let's see if there's something we can do. And then mm -hmm. and we basically quote a million dollars off collectively. Right. 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 Okay. Got it. So. Fair enough. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give each one of you an opportunity to tell me, this is not a vote so much as it is just taking of a consensus, uh, what 
you think we ought to do with respect with respect to the levy? That is, uh, raise it and how much? If you, if you say you raise it, I want you to tell me how much, how much to keep it flat or reduce it, and if so, how much? And you could also say whether or not you think you would like an abatement in the future, but we're not really voting on that tonight. That's not something we can actually uh, vote on right now. So, um, yes, Greg. Um, uh, before you start, I, I just want to uh, say that I pulled up last year's uh, levy document that was passed by the uh, Board of Trustees, and the actual grand total amount that was passed was six million nine eighty three seven twenty five. So that's six million nine eighty three seven twenty five. Okay. So if you're voting, 6 .9 million. yeah, if you're voting to keep it flat, that's the number it would be flat at. Okay. All right. Um, okay. All right. Fine. So um, I'm going to just start with uh, I'm going to go by seniority for uh, less uh, for uh, no other good way to do it. Linda, I think you have the most seniority on the board, don't you? I think so. <laughs> okay. All right. Um. Okay, so my reasoning is I'm always looking not only for what's happening right now, but for the future of our library and also for um, for having money in the bank. I, I, I was for the abatement, but I'm also looking mm -hmm. for our security. So in with everything in, that I'm looking at, I would like to um, raise it half, uh, and that would be like a 1.2 or 1.15 percent. So it'd be like 82,000. Okay, so you're saying 1.15 percent increase is what you're proposing. Yes, and then if we see how I'm just really nervous about what property taxes we're not going to get in the future based on unemployment rates. It really scares me for our library and keeping everything stand and then having money in the bank for our future. Mm -hmm. um, how, again, we can look and see how things go. Um, I, I don't want to go up to the 2.3. I know we can, but, um, but yet it yeah. concerns me to also go flat. Um, just for the reasoning of our uncertainty at this time. But that's my point of view. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you, Linda. Carolyn, I think you and I are tied for seniority next, I think. Oh, that's right. We ran together. Oh, no, you were here before me. Oh, did that's... you fill somebody's spot? Oh, yeah, I did. I did. Fill yeah. Okay. So... All right. So I have a little bit more seniority. Yes, Greg. So um, I just want to be clear on what Linda is suggesting um, by raising it one half of the uh, CPI, which is one point, which would be one point one five percent. That if you apply that to the six million nine eighty three, you end up with a levy amount of seven million oh sixty four oh thirty seven. Is okay, that what so you is that what you intend, Linda? Oh, excuse me. Yes, Linda, I think, yes, yeah, she's shaking her head, yes. Sorry, yes. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure. It's a little bit like over 80, was what, 82,000? I don't have my calculator. Right. Yeah. Which doesn't bring us anywhere near what we were 2012 even. Right? Okay. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Linda. Uh, I'll go next then. Um, I'm also concerned about the uh, fiscal well-being of the library. Um, I, I'm very concerned about uh, raising the levy in, in this climate. Um, so I would advocate keeping it flat. Um, and that is keeping it at the same rate that we passed in 2019. Um, I hope very much the economy improves and that the outlook uh, for um, tax collection is good uh, next year. Um, I, you know, an abatement, that's something we can always consider six months down the road. I don't, that's a possibility. I'm not gonna say 
whether I would vote for that or not when it came around. It would really depend on what the circumstances were in another six months from now. So that is uh, what I would uh, advocate for. And Carolyn, Carolyn, I'm asking you for what uh, increase or decrease you would like, not for what you know particular items you might con uh, cut or not, but just what rate you're advocating for in terms of the levy. Flat, increase, decrease. Um, I would like the levy to reflect our library's financial needs. And um, I believe Greg said last year, the levy amount was 6,983,725. Now, I believe the levy doesn't include special revenue or special reserves. Um, the levy includes special revenue. It includes revenues, but not reserves. Okay. Special revenue, yes. Okay. Yeah, revenue's the little one. Well, we just added three million to special reserves, uh, and I think that pretty much padded us for emergencies. Um, I I can't say that. Um, and then again, Greg, I'm looking at your levy abatement spreadsheet you gave us in March, right in the you know in, in the midst of the pandemic, and it showed that we would be receiving um, incrementally um, like hundreds of thousands, anywhere from 500 to 200. From so Carolyn, I, I'd like you to focus on so what I'm thinking, are you advocating I'm, for? I'm getting there. Well, I'm okay, thinking, we, we all wanna to talk tonight and it's getting later. Uh, what can I say? You um, can say the rate that you monthly, want. With these monthly investments that we can count on, um, along with the fact that we have 3 million, I think, in investments now. We have 11 million. I don't see a financial need that the levy even needs to be at 6-9. I think we are well insulated, and um, I'm not interested in increasing or even leaving it flat. I don't think it makes sense to increase it now and maybe entertain a an abatement later it's just not logical but that's where i stand okay i'll just put you down as decrease all right now the next two people patty diane uh i forget which one of you two were next uh, patty okay patty patty is the next seniority what is, what is your uh, position patty um i think flat and i have many reasons why first of all we are in a questionable time of year our situation right now and second, we have a pending lawsuit. And third, one month only, we had FOIAs that cost the library over $4,000. We have these kind of unexpected expenses that are still occurring, even though we're in a pandemic. So therefore, I think flat, I don't see going down. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, very much. Uh, Diane. Um, yeah, I would like to say that I really feel bad for our residents. I think that many are suffering and we just don't know the future. Our economy is dropping like crazy. Um, I just say keep it flat. I would like to keep it flat and not increase anything for our residents. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to go uh, alphabetically. I guess, uh, Becky, that would mean you would be next, I think. Yes. Okay. Uh, I am a, am of a mind to keep it, keep it the same as well. Um, I understand that, you know, we had a little bit less, we had a million less this year because of the abatement. Um, so keeping it flat would mean that we would not take that million off it, correct? Oh, okay. correct. So I, correct. I think that we definitely need to get that back in there because of other things that may pop up and even looking forward the 10, 15 years from now on possible renovations down the road, we need to get some money back above the line and not be going towards a decrease. Um, and I do feel like that would be pretty fair to the residents because we're not actually increasing anything. It's staying the same. 
uh, but still giving us a little bit more than we had this year. Uh, so considering all that, if I, and I am saying that, yes, I want to keep it the same, I would not probably be in favor of an abatement at some point later on. I, that could change. I don't know, but my perspective on that right now would be no, we, we need to keep that million dollars. Okay, Becky, thank you. Uh, Omer? Uh, my uh, vote, <clears throat> and I'll give the reasons right afterwards, is to keep the uh, uh, levy the same, to keep it flat. Uh, the reasons, uh, as Greg pointed out in his, his excellent presentation, um, if we keep it flat, we still stay in the black. And we stay in the black by a reasonably comfortable margin, uh, maybe not as comfortable as we would want it to be, but it's still a, a comfortable enough uh, that we're not risking going into the red if we keep it flat. Number two, I am very, very uh, averse to the idea of raising taxes during a pandemic and during a period where there is potentially high unemployment. Third, I think we need to understand our, our role. It is not our role to determine when people who are financially having difficulties are, are going to pay their property taxes. Since the levy is a portion of property taxes, um, if somebody's having financial difficulty, uh, the governor has delayed some of those payments uh, or the state has delayed some of those payments, the state legislature will take that up, et cetera. Um, it's just not a decision uh, for a library board to say, well, we're going to try to counteract um, higher orders of government in terms of their dealing with the economic crises. Those who are thankfully still employed uh, should hopefully be able to pay their property taxes at the same level that, from our chunk, at the same level that they paid last year. For those who are not employed currently, you know, we hope this will change very soon. But if it doesn't, I think we need to leave that responsibility to those who are better positioned to assist those individuals, namely the state of Illinois and not the local district library board. Okay. So All right. again, I, I vote for flat. Okay. Th thank you, Mayor. Um, so um, what I'm hearing is one for an increase, one for a decrease, but most for keeping it flat. So uh, Greg and Susan, if you would prepare the paperwork for a levy that would keep the levy flat, that is the same as, tw as uh, the 2019 one that we passed for this year, I believe there will be enough votes to pass it um, next month. Um, so I think that's the uh, indication that the board is giving you at this point, and the vote will take place at our November meeting. And uh, did either one of you, Greg or Susan, have any questions of us, the board? No. No, thank you all for your thoughtful attention. Okay, all right, fine, fine. Uh, so the next thing on our agenda is other, and uh, I should mention that under our bylaws, whenever the board uh, replaces uh, members of the board, a new election of, uh, of officers should take place. Unfortunately, this did not get on our agenda for this month, and I, I don't want to violate the Open Meetings Act. I'm not sure if that would or not, but I suggest we do that at the beginning of our next meeting, uh, elect the officers. And that election would be for officers just until our next election. And so then when May rolls around, we would have to elect officers again. Uh, but that's just the way our bylaws are structured. So um, is there any other other um, Carolyn? I have an other, but I have a question. This wasn't an election. It was an appointment. Uh, you're correct. This was an appointment of new officers. You're correct. I don't know if we change your roles now. I think we change them at the election every two years. Uh, well, what we do now after we have new people appointed, so we have new people on the board, per our bylaws, we need to elect officers that will serve until new members are elected at the next election. So it's it's just for a short period of time. Okay, I don't recall ever doing that when we appointed someone, but maybe we you did. You know, I think, remember, remember when Tim Spadoni rewrote the uh, uh, bylaws so much? I think that was a change that came about at that time. Okay. You're right, we didn't do it that okay. way in the past. 
Okay. But, um, I, I'm going to thank Tim for making us <laughs> okay. do this yeah. like three times within one year. We have to have these yeah, officer right. lectures. There's a thank you, Tim. Time. Anyway, uh, that, that's neither All right, that's there. fine with me. But I did have okay. a question for other. Um, yes. Diane, thank you for your email about something new and that we can click on this link and end up going to the video. So I tried that today and you know, I always say if something goes wrong. So I clicked on the video and a screen popped up. It said, enter your email and name. And I didn't because I'm thinking I'm in the wrong place. And then it says, click open on the dialog to show your browser. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where I ended up. This is so I can get to the video, correct? Of the last meeting. The link that you sent us? Diane, we can't hear you. Oh. I, unmute yourself, Diane. When you, when you click on the video, it should take you right to the YouTube. Okay, I clicked on the link and it asked for my email name and uh and my email and my name. I'm I've never seen that. Okay. Well, you know what? And it could be, you know, Zoom and Google are driving me nuts. I will try it again. And if I have a problem, I'll send you and Susan an email, okay? Yeah, we'll check it out on our end as well. So thank you. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, matters uh, to bring up? Uh, then the last thing I just want to say is once again, uh, welcome, uh, Omer and Becky. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to working with you uh, uh, throughout the upcoming year, uh, throughout the rest of this year anyway and into the next year. And um, we uh, don't have anything else we have to address this evening. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. I, I second. Okay. Go ahead. All right, Diane I Winberg, yes, you got to you. <laughs> okay, Sounds Karen. Good. Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Becky. Yes. Diane. Diane. Unmute. Okay. I think she's saying yes. Umar. Yes. Patty. Yes. And Linda. Yes. Have a good night, you good? everyone. You good, everyone. Thanks. Welcome Thank you. you two. Well, it's been okay. A okay. Bye. Bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>